So uh, we'll change the order a little bit and have uh, Dr. Sharon D'Souza presenting her paper first as she has to be elsewhere. Thank you very much for the consideration. They put an overlapping session, so there's a talk. Okay. Where is Sharon's paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Your paper is uh, 1510. Second page, second yes. paper. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and it's a great honor for me to be presenting here. Today, I'll be presenting our work on something which is very close to my heart, on trying to generate corneal endothelial cells in an ex vivo model. So uh, none of us need to be told why we are doing transplants. Obviously, there's always a corneal need. And most commonly, for some conditions like this, like Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, the treatment is endothelial keratoplasty, or in more advanced stages, we are looking at doing a full thickness corneal transplant. But we all know the severity of global shortage of tissue and, of course, the problems related to corneal grafts which lead to a graft failure and thereby worsen the cycle, vicious cycle of loss of tissue or shortage of tissue. And we're looking at ways to bypass this in whatever way we can. And one of the most uh, tried, and, tried methods around the world is to try and generate and transplant corneal endothelial cells. And of course, we are aware of the landmark work which has been going on by Professor Kinoshita and group, uh, where they are trying to generate corneal endothelial cells from other corneal tissue. The challenge is there is, of course, we are using an already limited tissue to try and generate more cells. And because it is from a corneal endothelial tissue itself, we know endothelial cells don't re regenerate. They stop at G1 phase. So we have to reverse it and then move forward again. And because they are originally corneal endothelium, it tends to go into fibrosis much more, which is the endothelial mesenchymal transition, and the cells die out much easier. Also, there's a problem with transfer and viability. So the plan for our work was to try and generate induced uh, corneal endothelial cells from peripheral blood, which we have ample of, and then move into integrating this into the uh, substrate and make sure that it maintains the morphology and function, look at what alternate approaches we have, move into animal experiments, and then go to clinical trials. So our work till now is that we have taken peripheral blood normal blood sample of peripheral blood, which was reprogrammed, those mononuclear cells were reprogrammed to form pluripotent stem cells. And as we know, stem cells can be then moved into any form of uh, type of cell, and then we moved it using, you know, through the neural crest cells into a corneal endothelial type of cell using the Sendai virus. These were then characterized because uh, we have to look at their, uh, their clinical characteristics and also different markers which are known to uh, be specific to corneal endothelium using RT-PCR and immunohistrocytochemistry. So it may not be very visible if you look at the third slide here, third image here on the left. Uh, the cells have over time formed the normal hexagonal pattern which we are used to seeing for our endothelial cell on a specular microscopy. And these last for about one month or so and these were derived from peripheral mononuclear cells from our peripheral blood. We then move to see the markers. Zonular occludence is a very, very important marker for endothelium, which is a paracellular barrier and regulates the permeability of the endothelial cells. We all know about the sodium-potassium ATPS pump, which is responsible for dehydrating the cornea, and the non-muscle myosin, which is an essential uh, process for migration of the cells. So all of these markers were found to be positive in the cells which we generated in the corneal endothelium. So this was done, and then we moved on to the next step of our plan, which was the integration. So uh, the way we did it was get the Institutional Ethics Committee. We looked at 10 cadaveric tissue eyeballs. And by a standardized protocol, we then looked at how to integrate these cells. So on the right side, the video playing is how we do a traumat atraumatic denudation of the endothelium. You have to make sure, because we need the DM there to remain there as a substrate for the cells to grow on, it has to be atraumatic, and we cannot strip off the DM how we do for a normal endothelial keratoplasty. The cells were injected in two ways. One was into an intact eyeball, and the other was placed onto the corneal button to see which would adhere better. And then after a period of time, we looked at the marking onto the cells. 
These are the uh, specular microscopy images of these cells before endothelial cell removal. After endothelial cell removal, you see you can see no cells visible there. And after the uh, cell injection, you can see that the cells have started adhering. They will be visible only if they adhere. Otherwise, it would not be uh, visible. Similarly, the same markers we looked at earlier, the ZO1 was found to be absent in the decellularized donor cornea and again present once we had injected the cells and incubated the eye. Uh, very interestingly, even the functionality of the cells was proven by the sodium potassium ATPS presence and the non-muscle myosin. So it shows that these cells not only look like endothelium, they are also already functioning like endothelium after integrating onto the cornea, the cadaveric cornea, uh, by injecting the cells. So where we are moving forward now is looking at other ways of doing tissue injection or delivery. The various scaffolds which we can use is like trying to form a DMEX scroll. So using a DM itself or using amniotic membrane. Uh, and this is where we are at. We are now moving to our animal experiments, which is going to be a New Zealand white rabbit. And the choice of that animal is because the corneal structure and uh, morphology is very similar to uh, human beings. So this is where we are at. Thank you for a kind letter. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, you had a slight error in one of your slides where it, uh, about fifth or sixth from the last where you showed uh, uh, before and it should have, the middle slide should have been after uh, removal, but it, both slides, uh, both it, the pictures it, it, had before, before, yeah. yeah. So just get that change if you're going further up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? I think wonderful study. After how many days you did the injection? Sorry, ma'am. After how many days of removal you did the injection? The injection is done immediately, ma'am. So we remove, it's an eyeball. So in the OT, we do the denudation. Uh, we have to wash out the cells which we have denuded now so that they are not residual and re-adhere. Uh, then once that is done, then we do the injection. We, I sutured up that incision site to prevent leakage and then inject it from another site using a 33 gauge needle, uh, 20 lakh cells. And then we, we do it immediately and then we incubate it for uh, three weeks rest of the experiments after three weeks yes so after three weeks we leave it in the organ culture media then we will uh, harvest the cornea in the globe and study it again thank you thank you, thank you. Sharon we call our first uh, paper now uh, dr. Jaya Kaushik dr. Jaya Kaushik is present Ankita Singh, Sunandan Bhatia, Rishi Sharma. No. Who's oh, oh, okay. Uh, second paper is Dr. Vaishali Verma. Yeah. To study various outcomes and complications after therapeutic PK and fungal corneal ulcers. The presenters are in the first two rows, please. Greetings to everyone. I will be presenting my paper on study of various outcomes and complications after therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty in fungal corneal ulcers. Incidence of fungal keratitis is about 5 to 10 percent of total corneal infections, and in developed world, it is about 6 to 35 percent, and in developing world, it is 22 to more than 50 percent. Surgical treatment is required in approximately one-third cases of fungal keratitis due to failure of maximal antifungal treatment or perforation. Therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty is the surgical procedure of choice in our generally emergent or urgent procedure in which visual rehabilitation remains the secondary importance. To assess visual outcome and various complications after TPK and fungal keratitis patients is the main aim of this study. This was a hospital-based prospective interventional study conducted in upgraded department of ophthalmology at SBBB Hospital, LLRM Medical College. Total 20 patients with diagnosed fungal corneal ulcer fulfilling the inclusion exclusion criteria underwent detailed ophthalmic examination and were treated surgically with TPK after obtaining an informed consent and were on regular follow-up till six months. Patients not responding to antifungal treatment for four weeks or with corneal perforation or with impending perforation following fungal corneal ulcer were included in our study and non, uh, patients with non-infective ulcers, corneal ulcers in previously grafted cornea or corneal ulcer patients who refused for the study or not coming for follow-up or with penetrating keratoplasty done for other indications or fungal keratitis patients with endophthalmitis and patients having late abnormalities were excluded from our study. 
Moving on to results and observations, this is a table showing local predisposing factors distribution. We can see that vegetative trauma is the commonest risk factor for uh, uh, fungal keratitis. This is the direct microscopic examination of the corneal smears. 30% uh, of our corneal smears were positive. And this is the uh, fungal distribution of the same smears. Uh, filamentous uh, fungi were the commonest, that is 83.33%. And this is the result of culture and or reculture of the corneal specimens. We can see that 70% uh, of the specimens were positive for culture. And fungal distribution was again filamentous fungi, that is aspergillus was the commonest. And types of ulcer, uh, non-healing ulcer were the commonest, that is 50% followed by perforation or with impending perforation. Uh, we can see that uh, freshly, fresh grafts that is preserved in MK media were associated with lesser number of uh, complications, while glycerin preserved corneal grafts were associated with more number of complications. This is the pre-operative visual acuity. Uh, we can see that most of our patients uh, in uh, finger count close to phase two hand movement. And this is the table showing post-operative complications in corneal grafts. In our study, glaucoma, suture-related complications, and vascularization were the commonest, uh, that is 25% each, and other complications were also there. Uh, this is the table showing graph clarity at different follow-up times. We can see that uh, at the end of six months, three patients were having three plus graph clarity, and uh, 11 patients were having two plus graph clarity. This is the table showing visual activity at different follow-up times. Again, at the end of six months, most of the patients uh, were having more than one meter finger count. And this is the table showing average post of visual acuity over six months in different subset of patients. Uh, we can see that uh, patients with non-healing ulcer without hypopion were having a good visual acuity. And so outcome of therapeutic penetrating keratoplastin fungal keratitis, uh, we have 85% of the grafts were therapeutically successful, while 15% were, were failed graft. In our study, non-healing corneal ulcer, perforation and impending perforation in fungal keratitis were the uh, main indication for TPK and uh, most common complications after TPK were found to be glaucoma, superficial and deep vascularization and suture related complications which were seen in 25% of cases. Infection in the form of recurrence of host pathology was 10% uh, in our study and rate of uh, graft failure or rejection was found to be 10%. Visual outcome after 6 months in majority of patients was between uh, 3 by 60 to 1 by 60 followed by less than 1 by 60 to hand movement. Therefore, moderate grade visual acuity was seen. In our visual, uh, study, visual acuity was less and complications were more in patients having perforation or impending perforation in fungal keratitis. Better grade of corneal graft and lesser preservation time for fa our favorable prognostic factors following TPK and fungal keratitis. In our study, MK media preserved corneal grafts showed better visual and functional outcome post uh, TPK than glycerin preserved corneal grafts. Scleral or anterior chamber involvement, that is mainly hypopion, were unfavorable, and proper patient compliance was also deemed important for the post-operative outcome. These are some images uh, of our patients. These are the references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vaishali. Just a couple of uh, quick comments. When, uh, uh, when you're preparing your thing, always do a spell check because it, it, uh, uh, the word inclusion was wrongly spelled in exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria. So if you go upwards, please change the spelling. Second is, uh, you, there was a slide in which you mentioned vegetable trauma, and then you mentioned trauma. What did you mean by trauma? Vegetable trauma is vegetable trauma, but trauma, possibly you meant mechanical trauma. So any kind of mechanical yeah, so trauma. Mention, mention mechanical trauma to okay. distinguish it from vegetable trauma, because you can't have a broad trauma word there because that encompasses all traumas yes. yeah and uh, you mentioned uh, in one of your penultimate slides if scleral out scleral uh, involvement had unfavorable outcome you cannot give a conclusion when you've not mentioned it in the main body of your work so in your main body you nowhere have you told us how many patients had scleral involvement and what was their outcome you only talked about perforation impending perforation and regular uh, non-healing ulcers so you've not mentioned scleral. How can you conclude that scleral has an unfavorable outcome? On the basis of this five-minute presentation, you cannot conclude. So never conclude anything which is not revealed to us as judges before the procedure. Yeah? Any other uh, comments? I yes. have a question. Uh, doctor, uh, what? Doctor? She has a question. Come. What was Please your post-op uh, regimen? What was your treatment regimen? Your treatment <laughs> regimen. Ma'am, post-operatively, uh, we give antifungals and uh, uh, steroids, that is prednisolone, 1% eye drops. Uh, so from the day one, you start them on prednisolone also? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, uh, in high-risk uh, cases, like... Uh, 
we start uh, steroids from the day one. It is not given on the first day. Usually we wait for two weeks uh, to see the other doctors. So don't uh, give the message that you start on the first day. And fungal keratitis is never given first day. So that was what I wanted to know. Actually. Okay. Uh, also, you didn't uh, tell us, did you do any uh, smears, cultures of the, the uh, corneas which you removed, the buttons which you removed? No, sir. Post operatively, we. Uh, the the we buttons that you removed, did you know what kind of fungus was there? Aspergillus, yeast, candida, what was. Sir, pre operatively, we did the smears and aspergillus. And then the buttons that you removed, you threw away? No, sir, we send them for culture, but I didn't mention it. Okay. okay. But do you know what, what, you, what you found? Yes, sir. Aspergillus was again the predominant the aspergillus. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. The reason I mentioned it because there is a regional difference in the type of fungus that we see north, south, east, and west. That is why. Okay, we move on to the next paper, Dr. Preeti. Prognosis and outcome of wavefront-guided single pass fourth row pupilloplasty in post PKP patients. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of my paper today is prognosis and outcome of wavefront guided single pass fourth row pupilloplasty in post penetrating keratoplasty patients. Financial disclosure is nil. So, penetrating keratoplasty is a surgical procedure in which we know that a damaged or a diseased cornea is replaced with a healthy donor cornea. But one of the most common complications of this procedure can be irregular corneal astigmatism, which can lead to significant visual disturbances such as blurred or distorted vision. So, in this study, we have explored the benefits, risks, outcomes of wavefront guided single pass fourthrow pupilloplasty in penetrating keratoplasty patients. So, it was a prospective observational study and it included a total of 13 eyes of 13 patients who underwent penetrating keratoplasty at least 6 to 12 months prior to uh, in our study and they had a pathologically dilated pupil of 5 millimeter or more in size and the graph was clear and these patients were subsequently taken up for the pupilloplasty. So all those who had an opaque or a hazy graft and where there was a loss of more than half of iris tissue had to be excluded. The assessment was done in the pre-operative period which included a comprehensive ocular examination and a Schemflug corneal mapping where the wavefront analysis was done in the pre-operative period where the actual pupillary size was noted and a predicted wavefront analysis was done where we set the desired post-operative pupillary size to 2 mm and where there was a significant difference between the pre-operative and the predicted uh, post-operative values, those patients were taken up for the single pass fourth row pupilloplasty. So all the patients pre-operatively and post-operatively were evaluated for their visual acuity, pupillary size and the wavefront parameters which included the optical path difference, the root mean square value for the high orders, astigmatism, coma and spherical aberrations. The optical quality summary was also uh, seen in the simulated visual acuity and the point spread function. The statistical analysis was done as follows and a p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered as significant. So as you can see in these pictures, clearly there was a reduction in the pupillary size with a, from a mean of 6.08 to a post-operative pupil size of 2.54. The wavefront parameters also showed a significant difference from the pre-operative that is after penetrating keratoplasty to after pupilloplasty these were the results where the uh, visual acuity showed a statistically significant improvement post-operatively there was an improvement and it was seen in the wavefront parameters starting from the root mean square values the higher order aberrations the mean astigmatism mean coma mean spherical aberration and the mean point spread function which suggested improved image formation. So a consolidated image is in front of you all where there was a statistically significant difference between the pre-operative wavefront parameters and the post-operative parameters while there was not a statistical uh, significant uh, difference between the predicted and the actual post-operative values. So after comparing all the three values, a significant improvement was seen in the visual acuity and in the wavefront parameters. The point spread function and the simulated visual acuity also showed a significant change and it was associated with a reduction in the symptoms like glare, post-penetrating keratoplasty. 
So to conclude, a large number of post-penetrating keratoplasty patients have poorer visual performance due to irregular dilated pupil. And the wavefront guided single pass fourth row pupilloplasty can be a cost-effective and efficient method in these patients. It can help us in predicting and providing an optimal visual rehabilitation of post-penetrating keratoplasty patients who experience irregular astigmatism. So the following are my references. Thank you so much. One basic question I have, Sir. was this uh, done during the time of uh, keratoplasty or? So 6 to 12 months post penetrating keratoplasty. But don't you think that will add to the trauma to the endothelium and probably hasten the graft Sir, failure? Uh, definitely, uh, the, the uh, authors had concern regarding graft rejection, but uh, this procedure being minimally invasive, it did not show us uh, many such complications post-operatively. All patients were fine, sir. No graft rejection was noted. Maybe retrospectively, we should do it during the time of the primary surgery rather than do it as a secondary procedure. I mean, that's my view. Sir, sir. Uh, was the specular done any time, as sir mentioned? There is always a risk of endothelial loss in any procedure. Ma'am. Did you document a specular pre and post op? Uh, not in this study presently, ma'am. We have not documented specular and another also. Another question. Uh, mm -hmm. You have mentioned that the wavefront guided astigmatisms, you know, that has improved. What was the real spec uh, spectacle correction? What was the refraction? So the, was there a change? Uh, yes, ma'am. There is a change in the best created visual acuity. So it has changed from a value of like in some patients from 1 by 60 to 6 by 12 as well. So there's been a significant improvement seen due to a reduction in the pupillary size. So in all parameters, ma'am. Why do you call it wavefront guided single pass fourth row? So, sir, we have... Because you're, you're using yes, the wavefront machine to calculate pre-op values and post-op so, values. Uh, but at the time of single pass, you're not using you're not, the wavefront not. machine. So, we are using the wavefront analysis to predict. So, we are only doing pupilloplasty for patients where we are predicting that the pupil size will, will reduce and the parameters will become better. So, we are not doing it for all, but we are also predicting the results and then we are proceeding with the pupilloplasty. That's why we have included wavefront guided. I think, I think the title could have been a little more explicit. You can, you can expand the title. We are, they allow quite a few characters in the Sir. title. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Any other questions? Just one comment actually. Sir. The single fourth throw pupilloplasty in itself is such a complicated task. Sir. As Sir mentioned when you are open sky it's easier to do it, right? Just a Sir. comment. Sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Bianjana Bashyal, influence of tear and serum proteonemic profile on disease severity in vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, IOC, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about our experience uh, in the study we conducted, uh, highlighting the influence of tear and serum proteomic profile on disease severity in VKC. I have no any financial interest. Uh, as we all know, VKC is a bilateral chronic inflammatory eye disease causing uh, quite a disturbance in the younger age group. Uh, it's more commonly found in uh, male patients. And there have been many studies where uh, they've evaluated proteomics uh, and their role in cases of allergic eye disease. And also, uh, there are other studies which highlight the role of matrix metalloproteinases, IgE, serum uh, vitamin D levels. So in this study, we have uh, evaluated the cytokines uh, and matrix metalloproteinases and IgE levels. So this is a, st uh, pros uh, this is a study where, uh, which was prospective non-randomized observational study. It was done after uh, approval of Institutional Ethics Committee. We included 50 subjects where 20 uh, patients were included in severe group and 20 in moderate groups and 10 were controls. The severity was based on the Bonini classification the, and the comparison was done uh, uh, on of these groups. So, uh, uh, in the study groups, uh, what we've done was uh, we've uh, evaluated the cytokines, interleukins 2, 4, 6, 10, 17, t uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferon gamma uh, from tear and serum of these patients using flow cytometry. And serum uh, tissue inhibitor of matrix metal proteinases 1, 2 were done using ELISA. Total IG and serum vitamin D were quantified. And tear allergen assay was done using Fadiatov test. So we've included more than eight uh, years of patients and less than 16 years of patients and uh, excluded the patients who were already on topical steroids or uh, were uh, steroid responder. And uh, 
in our study, the overall level of cytokines were raised in tiers of the patients in the group with active disease compared to the controls. But since the individual values were quite fluctuating, so, uh, it was not showing any statistical significance. Whereas we can see the IL-6 level, which is uh, hiked up in tier as well as uh, uh, serum. Uh, we can see that they have quite significantly increased in tier as well as in serum. But in serum, it was statistically significant, whereas in tears, it was not. And uh, interestingly, I wanted to highlight this interleukin-10 levels, which was seen in the uh, study group, which was higher. And uh, also, the interleukin-10 uh, was low, uh, seen higher in control group. So uh, this uh, is a, a new... Uh, a, a new study that we have evaluated that it suggests the role of in, interleukin 10 being anti-inflammatory agent so it was present in higher amount in uh, the control group and also serum interleukin 17a which was present higher in uh, study group uh, here we can see this uh, interleukin 17a which was quite high in uh, tears as well as the serum serum was quite spiked up so this was uh, present uh, in many of the study group patients so uh, coming to tissue inhib uh, inhibitor of matrix metalloproteinases, the overall uh, values were comparable between, uh, of the t uh, TIMP2 was comparable between the two groups of study and control. But uh, tissue inhibitor 1 was uh, present in lesser amount in the overall study group, but whereas it was present in higher amount in the severe VKC group compared to moderate VKC. Uh, coming to keratoconus where we evaluated using pentacam in the severe vkc group we uh, found that 50 percent patients were uh, having keratoconus whereas uh, the 15 percent of moderate vkc were having keratoconus but also in our study there was uh, one patient had keratoconus and uh, the severe uh, vkc group had higher osdi score compared to other moderate and control groups and comparing serum vitamin D levels, it was uh, lower in uh, study and control groups. The normal range uh, of serum vitamin D is more than 20. Overall, the values were lower in both the groups, uh, didn't show any significance. And uh, coming to these allergic factors, the mean allergy tier allergen was uh, higher in severe VKC group compared to moderate VKC group. So uh, in our uh, study, we've observed that uh, the serum IL-10 was significantly raised in healthy controls than patients with active disease, as IL-10 is anti-inflammatory cytokine, which, uh, disease, uh, which decreases the antigen-dependent cellular activation in allergy. Also, serum interleukin 17A was detected only in patients with active disease. Serum uh, TNF-alpha was present in cases with severe uh, dry eye, uh, with OSDI score of more than 33. Serum IgE was raised in study groups. 14% in the study group had keratoconus. The mean OSDI values were higher in higher clinical grades of the disease. Serum vitamin D were marginally uh, better in controls, but not significant. Since this study was conducted during COVID times and after COVID, and uh, because of less sunlight exposure, it might lead to lesser vitamin D levels, even in healthy controls. So in our study, we conclude that we found the disease severity uh, of VKC is significantly influenced by TR and serum cytokines, especially IL-10 and IL-17. Thank you. Thank you. Madhuka? Yeah. Uh, is there anything new you found in the study? Because we expect all these parameters to increase anyway. Uh, because various studies uh, have highlighted the role that uh, highlighted that IL-10 is uh, raised in uh, cases with uh, VKC. But in our study, it was opposite. We found that it was higher in controls than the uh, patients with disease. So uh, IL-10 is also is an anti-inflammatory agent so maybe that its presence in the control groups uh, signify that it is uh, in turn reducing the other influence of other cytokines as well uh, one of the things in your conclusions uh, you gave some observations in the observations some of those things which were statistically significant you mentioned but some of the others you did not so it's better in when you're giving the observations this was statistically significant, this was not. For example, you mentioned keratoconus was higher in the vernal conjunctivitis group, but that was 14%. It was 10% in your control group, so it is not statistically significant. No, that so, was so, so, you know, an observation which is not statistically significant carries much less weight than one which is statistical, because it's anecdotal, it could be explained away. So when you're giving your final conclusion, it's nice to classify only those which are statistically significant, then you say these are the other observations that we had in this study. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sujata? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We, Dr. Jaya Kaushik has come now. Yeah, come.
good morning everyone uh, i shall be speaking on a small modification a uh, minor modification of a no uh, open sky technique so uh, my topic is partial open sky method a novel technique to avoid the open sky condition during triple procedure uh, as a cornea surgeon despite years of experience whenever we do triple procedure and in cases of complicated pre op uh, the indications while taking out after taking out cataract there is always uh, you know uh, we we may enc encounter the vitreous push sometimes iris push and uh, the most dreadful condition is uh, expulsive hemorrhage whatever we try we give patient uh, manitol pre op manitol or whatever we try it may happen sometimes and it is a very very dreadful uh, situation for a cornea surgeon so uh, there are various modification have been adopted by various surgeon by putting a uh, scleral fixated iol to prevent that vitreous push or pupillary expansion devices uh, just to control the intraocular pressure and that complication here we describe a novel technique modification as a partial open sky technique during this surgical step of refining and excision of the host corneal tissue so indications are same except the infective pathology so uh, these are the small uh, some uh, picture pictorial uh, presentation here after cutting the host uh, tissue only some part of it 2 to 3 clock are the 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 donor the host tissue is attached it remains like a hinge and prevent in, uh, the uh, vitreous pressure so after taking out uh, the lens next step is uh, iol is being put what is the difference is throughout this procedure we remain one uh, clock hour of uh, the host tissue attached as a hinge either we can uh, suture remove it entirely and then suture it or we can uh, leave, uh, leave it attached and if we feel there is a lot of pressure coming out and after placing two anchoring sutures we can cut that host tissue so it is just a minor modification of a existing technique this is a small video short video showing uh, the modified uh, technique after refining the tissue is uh, host tissue is being cut and some part of it remain attached the nucleus is delivered nicely and after placing iol uh, this tissue is being cut so throughout this this step is an uh, you know increased so that the i have uh, noticed myself that the the vitreous pressure remain controlled so uh, the results i have done almost 8 cases uh, out of 23 triple procedure in our center last 2 months and uh, in two months uh, duration and all uh, patients successful ccc lens explant explantation with iol within the back was achieved and the vitreous push and pressure was not observed there was no complication throughout advantages of such uh, of this novel technique is that it greatly increases the safety profile of the corneal transplantation plantation for full thickness procedure there is increased control during cataract extraction the technique required a negligible learning curve for novice surgeons there are no complication of vitreous push or expulsive cor choroidal hemorrhage were encountered and there is no actually appreciable increase in surgery time no uh, extra uh, funds or expenditure involved in this procedures but there is definitely a limitation of the procedure that our te technique is just limited by the fact that this technique cannot be useful in cases of therapeutic keratoplasty uh, on account of contamination of the do donor grafts and for definitive prevention we needs to uh, do more uh, number of cases and rct with a standard technique longer follow up cases are also uh, required for post op follow up thank you Uh, one question i have have you used uh, iv manitol before yes. pre op for all sir, cases sir in all cases of triple procedure or any yes. corneal transplant whether it yes. is lamellar one also we have always given iv manitol half an hour to one hour before the surgery uh, how does this uh, keeping a hinged uh, cornea there 
How does it prevent a supracorridal hemorrhage? What is the mechanism in yes, your sir. opinion? So, sir, actually mechanism in scientific thing I cannot explain. But there is some anatomical uh, persistent, uh, persistence of the same host tissue. Because sometimes I have noticed that there is, beside everything uh, going ideal, there is lot of push from the beh uh, behind. In those cases, having that uh, hinge, immediately we turn it back. No, that I agree, that it is, it is a good, uh, for your anxiety, it helps you because you can immediately close yes. the wound. Yes. That is correct, but it doesn't prevent any, if a supracorridal is to occur, it will occur. Yes. What will prevent it, as Madhukar says, is mannitol, which you are giving, which a flaring a ring in all, in all, have a low index of putting a flaring a ring, so that you can keep the sclera open, so yes. that, so these things will help more, this is more for psychological, help that and ready availability of tissue, tissue. to close down yes, and as you said you can take two sutures first i normally take three sutures sir. Uh, uh, and then cut off the uh, in because the hinge is small yes i take three sutures only the fourth one i take after chopping off the uh, Absolutely. so this is a, actually it's it's a fairly well known uh, yeah. technique it has been sir. tried before sir. yeah so we just call this a sliding graft technique. yeah That's yeah it. it's called by different names yeah. but it is there yeah sir. describe thank you thank you sir Dr. Murlida Ramapa is here. Dr. Murlida, any news from the... No? Dr. Priyanka Pantola? Good morning everyone. The title of my paper is Outcomes of DMEC using technician prepared DMEC graft at the eye bank. So as we all know DSEC and DMEC are the two most common uh, procedures done for endothelial diseases. Uh, however DMEC is now being increasingly preferred in fuchs and other endothelial conditions which have a favorable anterior chamber dynamics. As we all know the adoption of the pre-cut DSEC tissues at the eye bank led to its wide scale popularity. Hence. Uh, uh, however, one of the main hurdles in the adoption of DMEC technique is the graft preparation step which adds to the surgical time, may have unpredictability at the time of surgery, sometimes may lead to postponement of the procedure and adds to the surgeon anxiety. Hence like a pre-cut DSEC, a pre-prepared DMEC graft was prepared at the eye bank and so in this study, we wanted to study the outcomes of DMEC using pre-stripped DMEC tissues which was prepared by the eye bank technicians. Our prim primary outcome measures were the graft clarity at one month, three month and the last follow up visit and the surgeon feedback. The secondary outcome measures were the best corrected visual acuity at one to two months, the change in pachymetry at one month and three to six months from baseline and the endothelial cell densities at three to six months. Uh, so this is the graph showing, showing the, uh, the DMIC scores which were prepared. The, the stool preparation started from April 22 and based on the feedback by the surgeons, the number of uh, pre-stripped DMIC tissues which were prepared increased significantly which jumped to almost, uh, if you can see that in the October 23, almost 42 pre-prepared tissues were prepared and distributed by the eye bank. So in this study, we analyzed the data of 218 consecutive pre-stripped DMEC tissues between April 22 and December 23. All these tissues were prepared in the eye bank by trained technicians using a standardized method, which was the double punch technique. The initial distribution was done in the, within the institute and the institute locations outside Hyderabad. Subsequently, the tissues were distributed to other centers in various parts of the country uh, from, uh, uh, by the request from the different surgeons. This was the donor selection criteria that was followed, age 40 to 75 years, endothelial cell count of more than 2500 and only fake eyes were taken for this. So this was the method which was used by the technicians at the eye bank. The donor epithelium was marked at the site of the hinge. Initial 9.5 millimeters partial refination was done and the peripheral skirt of DM was removed after uh, staining the, uh, uh, the endothelium with trepan blue. Uh, the DM endothelial complex was separated, leaving only the area of the hinge. A stromal window was made, repeat staining was done, and then the subsequently the tissue was transferred to the viewing chamber, and it was transported in the corneal storage media, either MK or cornisol. 
So these are the results of our study. 218 consecutive pre-strip DMACT tissues were analyzed. Out of these, 13 could not be utilized. In 12 cases, the tissues did not unfold, either because of the intraoperative uh, difficulties in unfolding, and on, in one case, there were tears while separating the tissue. The three, three patients were lost to follow up, hence a total of 202 tissues were analyzed. Out of these, 38 tissues were sent outside the institute network on request. For these, uh, we excluded these tissues from the analysis for BCV and pachymetry and only surgeon feedback was taken regarding the rebubbling and other issues uh, regarding the graph. These are our donor tissue and the recipient tissue characteristics. The most common indication for surgery was a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy followed by FECD, eye syndrome, PPMD and then followed by other causes like post HSV. Uh, out of these 11 patients underwent DMEC for a previous failed graft and in 35 patients cataract surgery was done along with DMEC. Uh, so, uh, a clear graft with a well-attached lenticule at one month was seen in 94.5% of the patients and this was maintained at three months and the last follow-up visit. 11 patients developed primary graft failure. Also, out of these, three patients, in three patients, there was difficulty in handling the tissue intraop, and in eight patients, the surgery was uneventful. Out of these 11, four patients had underwent rebubbling for a detached lenticule. The rebubbling was done in 17 patients, which was 8.4%. Uh, out of these, 13 had clear graft at the last follow up, and four developed primary graft failure. The average pachymetry preoperative was 682 with a standard deviation of 120. At one month, it was 559 and at three to six months, it was 513. The baseline endothelial cell count was 2849 and the endothelial cell density at three to six months was 1367. Uh, when we analyzed the best corrected visual acuity, 50.6% uh, uh, of the patient had a best corrected visual acuity of 2040 or better. And uh, these are the other uh, tables showing the visual acuities in different patients. Surgeon feedback was taken. There were few feedback regarding peripheral tears in the initial tissues prepared. And uh, others had requested for pre-marking the tissue as well. Uh, so as we saw that the graft failure rate, we compared the graft failure rate in the initial 40 cases followed by rest of the cases. So the graft failure rate subsequently decreased as the experience of our technicians increased in preparing the tissue. Hence, the graft failure rate in our study is comparable to other uh, to outcomes of uh, tissues of other eye bank prepared tissues, and they also compare to surgeon prepared tissues. And the rate of rebubbling was also comparable. Hence, uh, to conclude, pre-prepared DMA graft by eye bank has good outcomes and is quite feasible. With increasing experience and expertise, the outcomes are uh, improve further, as we showed in our study, and it, this will help in wider adoption of this technique. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? You you need to practice a little more and uh, titrate your time because you when you go above time it cuts down from your yeah excellent work uh, big body of work 200 plus cases by technicians is great but if you get, can drop some slides cut it down to five yeah any comment thank you yeah, thank you. Next paper, Dr. Rumi Das. Microbial analysis and sensitivity pattern in suture related corneal infections. Microbial analysis and sensitivity pattern. Better take the second mic down also. Yeah. Jara on karna? Dono? Okay, go ahead. Good morning all. My topic for today's presentation is microbial analysis and sensitivity pattern in suture-related corneal infections. Uh, suture-related corneal infections following ophthalmic surgeries pose significant challenges in clinical management and can lead to adverse outcomes. Understanding microbial etiology and drug susceptibility pattern is essential for guiding antimicrobial therapy and optimizing treatment strategies. Hence, this uh, study was carried out to analyze the microorganisms responsible for suture-related infections and determine their drug susceptibility pattern and also to evaluate demographic and clinical profile related to these cases. 
It's a retrospective study conducted at a tertiary eye care hospital in South India from Jan 2022 to June 2023. Data from patients diagnosed with uh, suture-related infections were collected and analyzed. Microbial cultures were performed to identify positive pathogens and their drug susceptibility pattern. After detailed slit lamp examination, any loose or broken suture was aseptically removed from the infiltrate site and directly inoculated onto 5% sieve blood agar and culture plates were immediately incubated at 37 degrees Celsius in 5% CO2 incubator up to 7 days. Confluent growth of organisms in inoculated area considered as a significant. And a bacterial species were identified based on colony microscopic morphology and standard biochemical characteristics. Fungal species were uh, identified based on spore morphology performing lactophenol cotton blue stain. In vitro antibiotic susceptibility tests were performed as per CLSI guideline by Kirby viewer this diffusion assay. And it, it was done mostly for this commonly used antibiotics. Coming to the results, on demographic profile, average age was found to be uh, 53 years and uh, they are related to agricultural background and they had a uh, past history of steroid exposure and uh, associated diabetes mellitus. Most common indication for suture placement was found to be in cases with uh, corneal tear repair cases who were presented within one to three months following surgery and with the loose suture. Majority of the cases exhibited resolved infiltrate after initiation of the treatment with no change in uh, uncorrected visual equity at one month post follow up. Out of the uh, total 66 cases, 32 cases were culture positive, out of which bacterial were seen in 22 cases, fungus were in 5 cases, yeast uh, in 2 cases, and mixed growth was seen in uh, 3 of the cases. Streptococcus pneumoniae and Staphylococcus epidermidis was found to be predominant among the gram positive bacteria, and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa was found to be negative, uh, uh, predominant among the gram negative bacteria. This, uh, Coming to the antimicrobial susceptibility pattern, Streptococcus pneumoniae showed 100% susceptible to fluoroquinolones and cephalosporin group antibiotic, along with 100% efficacy to vancomycin and chloramphenicol. Whereas Staph aureus showed 100% resistant to all fluoroquinolones and 100% susceptibility to vancomycin, gentamicin, and tobramycin. Craig uh, Christani is a pathogen which showed multidrug resistant to all the tested antibacterial. In gram-negative bacteria, Pseudomonas aeruginosa showed 100% uh, susceptibility to all the tested antibacterial except the cephotexin, whereas all other gram-negative bacteria were 100% susceptible to fluoroquinolones. Out of the 12 revised cases, after culture positive re uh, report, infiltrate uh, result was in 50% of the cases, although in one case graft infection occurred despite the maximal uh, treatment. So our, uh, in our study, it was uh, found that middle-aged individuals in the group of 41 to 60 years are notably susceptible to suture-related infections. However, extreme of ages uh, like 4 years and 70 to 77 years case in our study highlights their susceptibility and prompt management. Association of diabetes mellitus and previous exposure to steroids reveal prevalent risk factors in those cases. Like other uh, previous studies has also uh, demonstrated hyperglycemia can facilitate microbial growth and can alter microbiota of ocular surface, leading to an upregulation of pseudomonas and acinovector species. As majority of the patient presented within one to three months following surgery, that emphasizes the importance of close post-operative follow-up and to promptly detect and manage those cases. Previous studies have concluded the existence of microorganisms on sutures that are either broken or loosely secured, and sutures exhibiting signs of erosions are prone to harboring bacteria, underscoring the imperative of promptly removing them after surgery. As we have seen, gram-positive organisms con com continue to be the predominant case for suture-related infectious keratitis. Our microbiological findings align with the <coughs> findings that identify streptococcus pneumoniae and Staphylococcus epidermidis uh, as the predominant causative organisms. So our study concluded that empirical use of chloramphenicol at a time of suture removal and during presentation for a short course can uh, curb the injudicious use of moxifloxacin. Chloramphenicol in combination with uh, polymexin B to cover both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is also advisable. And this strategy aims to reduce the development of drug resistance and reserve moxifloxacin for clinically warranted cases. So the key home message from this study is like, as we all know, gram-positive bacteria are commonly implicated in suture-related infections, suggesting that initiating empirical therapy with chloramphenicol in combination with polymexin B may be preferable in cases with suture-related corneal infections. Here are my references. Thank you.
Thank you. So all these are uh, only suture uh, culture, or uh, you did scraping also? Yes, ma'am. Uh, like uh, all the cases which are presented with suture infiltrate, we uh, remove the suture and the slit lamp, and we culture on the blood other plate, ma'am. On slit lamp only. So those are associated with infiltrate or only loose suture? Uh, they are first on presentation. They are some are with infiltrate and some are with infection infiltrate sign, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned the words efficacy in one slide and the next thing was susceptibility. What is the difference between efficacy uh, to Venko and this and susceptibility? Uh, Are they the same? It's the same. Then use the same words because you confuse me by putting susceptibility, susceptibility, efficacy. Suddenly I wondered what is something efficacy. So don't use different words. Yes, sir. Second is what, what exactly do you mean by exposure to steroid? Uh, sir, uh, like uh, most of the cases are presented to, uh, are the cases of corneal tear repair cases, sir. And some PKP cases are also there. So those cases have uh, used uh, steroid uh, before presentation, sir. So patients who were on topical steroids. Yes, you see, sir. exposure to steroids doesn't convey anything. There could be a steroid sitting in the room and you are exposed to the steroid. There could be a steroid taken by mouth. So be more specific. What you mean is patients who were on topical okay. steroids. Yes. Correct? Yes, so mention that so that it gives a clearer picture to the audience. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a good study. I mean, the take-home message is that chlorum, most of us use moxifloxin and yes. most of the infections are uh, streptococci or uh, and it's susceptible a, to yeah, chlorophenicol is a good option. If we see the total cases is 66, sir, out of uh, which only 34 is culture positive, sir. Most half is like culture negative cases. So in the periphery or like in the first contact, if patient is presented with a suture infiltrate, so if we are in the dilemma, like if person is not in like cornea specialist or for like general things, sir, then they can like can start with the chloramphenicol and then they can send the patient for culture of the suture so that after confirmation if patient is not resolving or infiltrate is not resolving then we can go for higher range antibiotic so that thank we you. can prevent the use. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Dr. Swati, evaluation of intrastromal keratoplasty with collagen cross-linking in progressive k -conus. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting a paper on evaluation of intrastromal lamellar keratoplasty with collagen cross-linking in keratoconus. I would like to thank AIOS and Professor Vanity for giving me this opportunity. The treatment modalities for progressive keratoconus in the current scenario mainly comprise of collagen cross-linking, the results of which we are already well aware of. Newer modalities include intrastromal keratoplasty, Bauman's layer transplantation, uh, collagen, uh, corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segment, and femtosecond intrastromal lenticular implantation. Intrastromal keratoplasty is a relatively newer tissue addition procedure for which we have insufficient evidence, and it offers scope in terms of improving refractive outcomes, biomechanical strength, and corneal stability in these patients. We conducted the study to study mainly the biochemical, biomechanical changes which occur following intrastromal keratoplasty with collagen cross-linking on a study group of 10 eyes of 10 patients with progressive keratoconus whom we followed up for a period of six months. We included those with a minimum thinness pachymetry of 350 to 400 microns with a best corrected vision of uh, less than 6 by 18 with spectacles, those who were intolerant or unwilling for contact lens wear, and those who were willing to participate in the study, and those with axial myopia and age under 18 years were excluded. So uh, I would like to show a small video of the same. We prepared the host bed using femtosecond uh, laser and we uh, created a flap of diameter 8.9 millimeter with a thickness of 180 microns. Following this, the donor tissue preparation was uh, done with uh, uh, under interoperative OCT guidance by harvesting a 150 micron donor lenticule of 8 to 8.75 mm using an automated lamellar therapeutic uh, keratoplasty machine and that was inserted into a manually created lamellar dissection by opening up the femtosecond pocket which we had created. This was done using a lamellar dissector and then we uh, put in the lenticule, uh, we slide it inside and then we flatten it out and following this as the lenticule settled uh, we subject the eye to uh, accelerated collagen cross-linking. 
So this is the table that shows the keratoconus severity staging as per the Bellin ABCD stage. And most of the patients were in the mean age of uh, 20 years. So if you look at the uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity, UCV showed an improvement in five patients and spectacle vision showed an improvement in six patients, which was statistically significant. There was also a statistically significant increase in the central corneal thickness as expected and the lenticular thickness stabilized by uh, month one going up to month six post-operatively. These are the clinical photographs with the corresponding ASOCT images. So if we look at the corneal topography changes, K1 showed a mean change of 1.06 diopters at the six month post-operatively with K2 showing a change of 2.42 and Kmax showing a change of 3.84 diopters. And all of these changes, as you can see in these tables presented, were statistically significant. Uh, these are the topography maps of the same. If we look at the biomechanical IOP, the IOP had raised significantly to 16.59 plus minus 3.14 millimeters of mercury, which can be attributed to the increase in the central corneal thickness. Various other Corvus ST parameters also showed a significant change, the notable ones being an increase in the stiffness parameter and a decrease in the deformation amplitude. And uh, the highest concavity radius more or less remained the same and the Ambrosia relational thickness horizontal also showed a decrease, which was statistically significant. Other parameters such as the 81, 82, the wing distance and DA ratio also showed statistically significant changes. These are Corvus ST graphs of the same, uh, depicting the same over the period of six months. So uh, I just wanted to draw parallels between similar studies which have been done in the past. And we have noticed that the changes have been similar. Like in the study done by Sri Ganesh and Brar, they performed uh, femtosecond intrastromal lenticule implantation with a smile lenticule. And they found a significant flattening of keratometry as well as change in the biomechanical param uh, biochemical parameters. And uh, Jin et al. also did Corvus ST on their patients and found a decrease in the DA ratio as well as the wing distance. As well as the study by Pedroti et al. who put in a refractive lenticule from the cadaveric cornea and found a decrease in both the integrated radius as well as the deformation amplitude ratio with an increase in the stiffness parameters. So I would like to conclude by saying that the pre-operative visual activity uh, showed a significant improvement along with the best corrected spectacle visual activity. Structural stability attributed to an increase in the central corneal thickness with significant flattening of the cornea observed in K1, K2 and Kmax with an increase in the corneal biomechanical strength. Corneal abrometry, we did not observe any significant change. So intrastromal keratoplasty along with CXL does enhance the tectonic stability of the cornea and achieves corneal flattening with visual acuity improvement. So the current evidence points to it as an alternative to stabilizing progressive keratoconus with thinner corneas. As it was done as a pilot study, we recommend that a larger sample size would be needed to support the statistical significance. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Any? Did you compare only with intrastromal keratoplasty? Sorry, I didn't get your Did you compare uh, intrastromal keratoplasty with collagen cross-linking? No, we had only one group and we uh, it was a prospective observational study on 10 patients who underwent intrastromal keratoplasty. Historically, you must have done intrastromal keratoplasty only. Uh, no, we did not compare. Very nice presentation, Doctor. Uh, what was the least pachymetry that you have uh, operated uh, on? The least pachymetry was about 390 microns, ma'am. I'll just show you the table. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Come. The next presentation, Dr. Juhi. Role of human corneal MIRNA-184 in fungal keratitis. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be presenting the role of human corneal MIRNA-184 in fungal keratitis. So as we know, corneal blindness is one of the leading causes of blindness second to cataract in developing countries. In corneal blindness, we see keratitis. And in keratitis also in developing countries, we see fungal keratitis being the common one. MicroRNAs, what are microRNAs? They are a class of small single standard non-coding RNA molecule. It regulates the gene expression at post-transcription level by binding to a target miRNA. So in, the, in those miRNAs, we are studying miRNA 184. 184 plays a crucial regulatory role in several ocular diseases. Its mutation is seen in keratoconus. However, the role of uh, miRNA 184 in fungal keratitis has not been studied. 
So in our study, we aim to identify differential expression of miRNA-184 uh, to identify the targets of miRNA by qPCR and to see its clinical utility. For sample collections, uh, we collected corneal swabs as well as corneal tissues. Corneal swabs were collected at the first visit when uh, patients came smear positive for fungus and uh, after st uh, starting the therapy, first follow-up uh, corneal swabs were collected. For tissues, we collected the post-transplant corneal buttons which were positive for fungus. As controls, we used the human donor corneas acquired from an eye bag. In these uh, samples and controls, we did RNA isolation and miRNA sequencing. For swabs, uh, the samples were frozen in zymobuffer thawed, they were transferred, tri uh, trisol was added, they were centrifuged and uh, the swabs were rubbed to the wall of the tube to release the cells and RNA was isolated. For tissues, again a trisol based manual method was done, samples were stored in trisol thawed, Chloroform was added, aqueous phase was separated by centrifugation, RNA was quantified using nanotrop. For target prediction, we used an online tool, it's a MIRTAR based tool. For functional analysis, a gene pathway network was constructed using a cytoscape. These are all online tools. Then real-time qPCR was done using the kits that are available and the expression level of miRNA was compared with an internal control, U6 is an internal control. These were the equipments. So, uh, by man Whitney U test, stat statistical analysis was done, and p value of less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. So, what we saw in our results was uh, the differential expression analysis showed that miRNA 184 was highly down regulated when uh, the infection presented at first presentation and in the poor outcome samples, whereas it was up regulated in controls and the uh, patients who were responding well to the treatment. Another thing we noted, uh, we, when we saw the target predictors, uh, we saw two pathways, P13 AKT signaling pathway and JAKSTAT pathways, which, had, uh, which, were the, which were our top hit pathways, which were the targets for miRNA-184. So coming to the discussion, we know fungal keratitis and infective disease, it rapidly progresses. Uh, it can cause corneal opacity and loss of vision. Several miRNA with profound changes in expression were found in infected cornea, suggesting that they do have a regulatory process in its pathogenesis. Expression of miRNA-184 is abundant in normal cornea was dysregulated in keratitis since they may be involved in corneal epithelial cell proliferation migration during wound repair. Another study which is done on mice uh, in 2006, uh, they saw that uh, miRNA-184 was 89-fold higher in the epithelium of a mice and uh, it, in contrast, its expression was absent in limbal conjunctival epithelium. In our study, the differential expression analysis, we identified that miRNA-184 is highly up-regulated in control samples but down-regulated in poor outcome ones. JAKSTAT and P13 pathways were a significant one. So we conclude that uh, it has a significant role in the, these two pathways which will provide a therapeutic value in future. Like in cancer studies for example, they are doing a study in breast cancer in which miRNA 10B, anti-miRNA anti 10B nanoparticles, they are, uh, it is under, under uh, process which can have a therapeutic uh, role. So we can have a targeted therapy against these miRNAs. Uh, and other than that, uh, it has a um, prognostic value wherein if uh, we can decide if it is down regulated, we can undergo uh, surgical, uh, uh, surgical treatment earlier than to wait for it to uh, get even uh, worse. So the limitation of my study is uh, it's uh, done on a small sample size, so further extensive validation is required. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Any See this uh, miRNA-184, yes, uh, there are previous studies which have, which have already shown that it is down-regulated in any sort of uh, uh, inflammation in the eye. So I, uh, uh, taking up fungal, uh, if you had taken up bacterial, you would have got the same down-regulation. If you had taken up any other inflammatory, you would have got the same down-regulation. So I don't think your study concludes that uh, targeting this as an approach. 
targeting this would be an approach for any inflammatory corneal condition? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but we, we, we do also have a prognostic uh, value to it. So if at the first follow-up we see it's still down-regulated, maybe we not wait for it to perforate or just try more uh, uh, medical treatment or maybe we can intervene at an earlier stage so that... Yeah, actually, see, this is the uh, uh, dis disconnect between lab and clinical because in a fungal, you're seeing a deterioration clinically even without a slit lamp or anything, you can make out a deterioration. Yes. You don't wait for an MIRNA 184 to tell you to be more aggressive or whatever. You go by the clinical picture. So it may not have too much of a clinical significance, though it does have a, uh, what you're proving is correct in the lab. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Siddharth Narendran. Nucleic, sorry. No. No, 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 no. It, all these papers are for Aragyachari. They've suddenly put this. Uh, have you presented this before? Yes, yes, sir. Achha, so this is not uh, considered. No, not for, okay, thank you. So this is not to be considered for the award. Go ahead. Yes. So good afternoon. So my talk is on the evaluation of a CRISPR-based diagnostic platform for fungal keratitis. So I have patents related to the CRISPR-based diagnostics for fungal infections. The unmet need in fungal keratitis is to develop a diagnostic modality which can be applied at the primary healthcare level. So our aim was to overcome this diagnostic bottleneck by developing a rapid and cost-effective point-of-care test for fungal keratitis using CRISPR, which we have termed as RIDMIC, which stands for Rapid Identification of Mycosis using CRISPR. So our two primary goals were first to develop the assay and then second to benchmark it against already existing diagnostic modalities. So this is the principle of the assay. It has two components an isothermal amplification step which amplifies the target fungal DNA if present followed by the CRISPR reaction itself which gets activated in the presence of the amplified DNA and cleavage occurs which is visualized as fluorescence. So this is how we interpret the results. When the fungal DNA amplifies, it triggers the CRISPR system to cleave a fluorescent reporter. So we have developed the assay for dual purposes as a point of care test at the primary healthcare settings and as a PCR alternative in tertiary facilities. So the straightforward, binary, qualitative readout, perfect for point of care testings, and a quantitative measure in tertiary facilities. So the first step was to test the specificity of the assay. As seen here, a positive test was seen with all tested fungal DNA, but not with bacterial or human DNA. Both the readouts are depicted here. All tested fungal DNA fluoresce, and a corresponding spike is seen in the spectrophotometer readings. Next, we tested the analytical sensitivity of the assay. So the limit of detection was around 13 to 16 genome copies, which is similar to the LOD of panfungal PCR as reported previously. The so next was to validate the assay in a clinical setting. Corneal swabs or scrapes were collected from 123 consecutive patients with smear positive microbial keratitis from three different tertiary eye care centers. Technicians were blinded to the results of the conventional test. They performed the rhythmic assay. So for the real time readout, we set the threshold of mean RFU plus three times the standard deviation from the RFU values obtained from health, 10 healthy donors. Meanwhile, for the visual readout, photos of the sample tubes were presented to three masked observers who graded them positive or negative based on the color. So the concordance between rhythmic and microscopy was 93%, 74% with culture and 83% with PCR. So here we show the mycological spectrum of the assay. So this data demonstrates the assay's versatility and ability to ac accurately identify a wide range of fungal species. So the visual and real-time readouts were in perfect alignment with 100% concordance. Additionally, the inter-observer agreement for visual detection among the three observers was 98.6%. So being a nucleic acid detection modality, we benchmarked rhythmic against panfungal PCR. So rhythmic showed a sensitivity of 93%, surpassing PCR 79%. Additionally, rhythmic specificity stood at 89%. 
compared to panfungal PCRs, 84%. The average time for diagnosis was 39 minutes with no notable differences between samples that were culture positive or culture negative. However, samples that were both culture positive negative and microscopy negative exhibited significantly longer times to diagnosis. So given the concern of fungal contamination, especially in tropical countries, we rigorously tested the assay using environmental samples from various locations, including sample collection areas and the assay's operational sites. As you, as you can see here, compared to the positive control, these samples turn negative results, which further exemplify the robustness of this assay. So to conclude, this is the first CRISPR-based system record, uh, reported for the diagnosis of fungal infections in any organ system. The sensitivity and specificity is compared to panfungal, comparable to panfungal PCR. It produces an easy-to-read binary readout. The turnaround time is less than 45 minutes, and it can be multiplexed for species differentiation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much for you. the keynote address. And with that, we come to the end of this uh, free paper session. Please await uh, uh, results. I think uh, those who have been selected for the next round uh, will be intimated by the scientific committee office in due course of time. Thank you. And we hand over the chair to the next uh, session. We'll take a picture with the, the those, those presenters who are here. Can you please come forward? We'll have a group picture with you. Thank you.